everybody. It is a cold January afternoon here in Gettysburg, Pennsylvania, and it's uh, not exactly the kind of weather that existed on July 2nd, 1863, but I'm standing on Seminary Ridge uh, right near the area where uh, General Longstreet would have been issuing instructions to his divisions on the morning and afternoon of July 2nd. Robert E. Lee, on the second day of the Battle of Gettysburg, had made a decision that he was going to attack the left flank of the Union Army. And he instructed James Longstreet, his old war horse as he called him, uh, to attack and roll up the Union left with his divisions. Well, the problem was Longstreet said that not all of Pickett's, none of Pickett's division had arrived yet and not all of Hood's division had arrived on the battlefield yet. So Longstreet had all of one division under McClaws and parts of a second division. The goal was and should have been to attack on the morning of July 2nd. I believe there would have been a very different result had that happened, but it didn't happen. In fact, by the time Longstreet got his men into position and was ready to launch his attack on the Union left with McClaws and Hood's division, it was actually around four o'clock in the afternoon. And by that point, the situation on the Union lines had dramatically changed. We're gonna take a look at some of the key sites involved in the attack by McClaws and Hood's divisions on the afternoon of July 2nd. I'm standing on what is known today as Longstreet Tower. Uh, it's one of multiple towers that were built back around the turn of the century uh, as observation points uh, to be able to see the battlefield better. And this particular tower is probably the best location on the battlefield to view the entire area of the Confederate right flank where Longstreet launched his attack on the afternoon of July 2nd. Behind me, you can see everything of the battlefield. You can see all the way up to Cemetery Hill in the north, running down Cemetery Ridge. You can see the, the Pennsylvania Monument right there in the background, all the way down running through. We've got the Peach Orchard very near to me, directly in front. And then there's the wheat field and all the way up then to uh, Little Round Top, which can be seen easily with the monuments in the clear area and Big Round Top. It was over the area where I'm standing that Lafayette McClaw's division was the attack. He was the left of the two divisions of Longstreet's assault. Hood was further to the right, and his job was to attack through Devil's Den and up to Little Round Top. Now, the problem, of course, with the entire assault was that it was predicated on bad information. The information that Lee had, because he didn't have Stuart's cavalry, Lee believed that the Union line only ran to the edge of Cemetery Ridge and that it was hanging out in the open with no natural barrier on the left flank. And so he believed that these two divisions, by attacking, would be able to hit and get around the left flank of the Union Army and just roll up that southern part of the fish hook. Well, there were two problems with it, which we will talk about a little bit later. Meanwhile, on the Union side, behind me, uh, along Cemetery Ridge, Dan Sickles III Corps had been placed into line with strict instructions to hold the line, to anchor from the center of the Union line down Seminary Ridge and up to Little Round Top, which commanded the entire battlefield. That was supposed to be the strong Union position, and it was strong, and it would have been a great, very easily defensible position. But as Sickles moved his men into line, he remembered something that had happened in an earlier battle where the Confederates had been able to take higher ground in front of him, place artillery on that ground, and shell his troops. And Sickles was not a career soldier. He had only been in the Army for a couple of years. He had gotten his position uh, because he was wealthy. He was a congressman who had uh, raised money and, and raised troops and been put in command of a brigade of those troops, eventually rose to Corps Command. And so he was not about to let that happen again. And so without orders, in fact, against orders, he moves his men forward. And instead of being in a straight line that is anchored by high ground on the left and by the second corps on the right, 
he instead puts his troops into a salient, kind of a, a triangle formation that can be attacked on two sides. And he did that just as Longstreet's attack finally commenced on the afternoon of July 2nd. Where I'm standing is actually the left flank of Hood's division, where it connected just behind me to the right flank of McClaw's division. Uh, the men, the Georgians under I believe it was Robert Robertson and Benning would have been marching across the field behind me and uh, while well, Robertson uh, was one of the lead divisions I believe and then over further to the right on the the right side was the Alabamian Brigade under uh, Evander Law which eventually attacked Little Round Top and so as Longstreet prepares his men he begins things with a 30-minute artillery bar barrage with several do dozen artillery pieces. And that had particularly strong effect on the salient, uh, kind of the apex of that salient in the peach orchard behind me. And it devastated those Union troops. And then just as the artillery bar barrage lets up around 4.30, these four brigades, uh, Texans, uh, a ton of Georgians, Alabamians, some Arkansas troops, march across this field and slam into uh, Dan Sickles' core at that salient. Behind me is the Emmitsburg Road, and that was a key position uh, concerning the action on July 2nd, because as the men under McClaws and Hood emerged from the woods on cemetery, Seminary Ridge behind me, uh, they were supposed to hit the Emmitsburg Road, and then Hood's division was supposed to wheel to the left, and his leftmost brigade would guide alongside the Emmitsburg Road, and the other brigades would fall in to their right and march up and roll up the Union flank. Well, of course, things didn't work out that way. A couple of things happened. One, of course, was that in the peach orchard behind me, there were Union troops, and their salient went over toward Little Round Top uh, to Devil's Den, which you can't see from here, but it's between here and Little Round Top, and that pr posed a problem. The other thing that happened was that as the troops were attacking across Emmitsburg Road, Hood had stood up in his stirrups uh, in front of his old Texas brigade and said something to the effect of onward my brave boys and take those heights beyond. And soon after that, an artillery shell exploded overhead and severely wounded him in the arm. Command of the, of the division at that point fell to the senior most brigade commander who was Evander Law, but Law was on the extreme right flank of the entire Confederate army and had no idea that he had taken command of the division. And so for a time, there was no division commander. Each brigade kind of did their own thing and things dramatically fell apart from there. I'm now standing in one of the most well-known areas of the battlefield, and that's the peach orchard. For obvious reasons, it remains a peach orchard to this day. And this orchard saw some of the bloodiest fighting, not only the Battle of Gettysburg, but of the entire American Civil War. It was here that the apex of Dan Sickles' Third Corps was to be found uh, in a brigade under, uh, under Graham. And they bore the brunt of one of what was described as the most gallant assaults of the entire war. Around 5.30 in the afternoon, about an hour after Hood's assault had been launched on the right flank, uh, and about a half hour after McClaw's attack had begun in this area, Barksdale's Mississippians come charging out of the woods behind me and launch this incredible attack that just shatters the apex of the Union line. Some say that that moment was actually the high watermark of the Confederacy and not the uh, charge by Pickett and other divisions the following day. Well, Barksdale led his Mississippians gallantly. He had been told that he should walk with his men, but he chose to ride a horse so he could be seen better. He led his men into battle. He was wounded several times, finally brought down by a gunshot to the chest, which mortally wounded him. He, uh, he asked his men to let his wife and children know that he had died at his post, and then he was left behind to be captured by the enemy. 
he died in a Union Field Hospital, hospital the following day. This area behind me would be the, the center of McClaw's line. It would be the apex of the Union line. So behind me from here then would be the Union line would have stretched to that side over toward Devil's Den. And then it also would have gone at an angle from this side back to uh, Cemetery Ridge. I'm standing perhaps 50 yards in front of the position that was held by the extreme left of Sickles line. And I'm looking out now behind me uh, toward the west. This is the field through which uh, John Bell Hood's division would have been marching as they came toward their uh, attack against the Union left. It's strewn with boulders. It's brutal ground. Uh, off in the distance, uh, uh, back up the hill is where you get to Seminary Ridge. Over here, beyond these trees, behind me here is the Bushman Farm, and it's near the Bushman Farm where General Hood would receive his severe injury to his arm. There's a poignant scene in the movie Gettysburg, and I don't know if it's accurate or not, but General Longstreet visits Hood in the hospital after he's been wounded, and Hood, in his delirium after having been drugged, uh, says, among other things, he says, worst ground I ever saw. And if you come to this spot and you look out over the ground that Hood's division had to march, and especially as they get across this area, go down into the valley where Plum Run is, the area they call the Valley of Death, down here in front of little or of Big Round Top, and you see the boulders that are strewn there, it is some of the worst ground I've ever seen on a Civil War battlefield. It is amazing to me that these men were ordered to attack. I'm guessing Lee didn't see the ground or just didn't care, uh, but the men who had to fight it understood what a terrible place it was to attack. Behind me is the direction from which Longstreet's attack would have come. Hood's men would have been pouring into this area from Seminary Ridge off in the distance. And I am standing now on what would have been the far left of Sickles' initial line. Uh, a single brigade of troops along with some artillery defended this position, which is marked to this day by these artillery pieces and this monument that you see behind me. And they held for two hours against the onslaught of Hood's division before finally having to withdraw. And just behind me, uh, you can see Devil's Den and then the valley below, which is where uh, the area of this valley that you see, there's Big Round Top. And now this valley here is where Plum Run runs. And the brigades of Hood's division would have poured through this area, especially Law and Robertson's brigades, who were on the right side of Hood's division and then they started their attack up Little Round Top from this position. You can see what an incredible position it was. The artillery had a commanding view of the entire field in front, all the way off to the road in the distance where just beyond that road is where the attack began by the Confederates.
once Hood's men made their way past the Union position here, they poured up and over this hill and into the area known as Devil's Den, which is down just below us. The entire area in front of us that we see, including Devil's Den and the rocks beyond Plum Run, eventually became known as the Slaughter Pen. Men were actually engaged in what they called Indian-style fighting, where they were they were ducking down behind these rocks wherever they could find them. They would get behind a rock like this one right here, and they would pop up long enough to fire and then duck down below once again uh, to be able to reload and then fire once again. And you can see all of the, the boulders and the run there down below. And then eventually they uh, fought, once they had secured this area, uh, brought their brigades through that valley and then began the attack uh, across up to Little Round Top. Some of the most famous images that we see uh, from the aftermath of Gettysburg were taken in this area and you can actually find the exact spots where some of the bodies were photographed because the boulders are in exactly the same spot today. Just ahead of us there is Big Round Top. And the uh, 15th Alabama, the regiment most famous for having attacked the 20th Maine, uh, actually climbed up and over Big Round Top there. And right there where Little Round Top is, just where it begins to slope down on the right side, just over the hill from here is where the 20th Maine was located. Several Civil War photographers, including Alexander Gardner, Timothy O'Sullivan, came to this area in the aftermath of the battle before the, the dead had even been buried and began to take photographs. They're some of the most uh, compelling photographs of the entire war. And they found a Confederate uh, soldier about 40 feet away with his rifle. And they dragged his, after photographing their body, they dragged it to this location uh, where stones had been piled and obviously had been used by Confederate sharpshooters to try and fire on men probably over on Little Round Top. But they placed that same body there and staged a photograph for dramatic effect. Uh, this was about four days after this young man had been killed. You can imagine the, the smell, the scenes, and yet they took this photo and uh, they used it and it was widely published. Uh, Alexander Gar Gardner and Timothy O'Sullivan, uh, one of them later commented that they came back to the same spot four months later and said that they found the rusty rifle still there along with the decomposed remains of that soldier who had apparently never been buried, at least not to that point. Well, after the Confederate troops had secured Devil's Den, they crossed this little stream here known as Plum Run. And just behind me, there's a monument uh, near the stream to the 4th Main. And those 4th Main troops were down here in front, and they were quickly driven off. And then the place where I'm walking now, you can, I'll, walk, I'll turn around so you can see behind me, Little Round Top. Uh, I'm following the ground that was covered by Robertson's brigade. And they eventually were to march up the hill and hit what would, have been, what would have been the right flank of Strong Vincent's brigade, uh, which covered the left side of Little Round Top. So we're actually gonna go ahead and start climbing up the hill and see exactly what Robertson's men faced as they marched up in the face of enemy fire. So imagine you're a Confederate soldier. You have already fought your way probably over a good mile of ground and you've pressed through, you've won several hard fought attacks already. And now you're faced with crossing a stream after going over the boulders of Devil's Den. And now you're faced with attacking up the face of this hill, which has got two full Union brigades on top along with batteries of artillery. 
they were already exhausted and now they've got to march up and just up about halfway you can see some of the monuments there that's actually where the troops would have been they weren't on top of the hill they were down a little bit and that was a standard military uh, tactic to do it that way but you can just see not only are you dealing with boulders everywhere but you're marching up the hill in the face of enemy fire you're already exhausted this just had to have been an absolute an absolute nightmare I mean, granted, I'm not as young as many of these troops would have been, but I've been to this battlefield a number of times. I've never attempted to do this, but I'm already getting tired and I haven't even begun to climb. They already would have had to march over a number of hills. I don't know. I don't know how they could have done it. I don't see a way that this would have been successful and I'm not sure why the attack was allowed except that they had been Lee's orders. And so they pressed ahead. I'm still not even close. I'm gonna come up here and stand on one of these boulders and just try to get a little better view of things. I haven't even begun to climb and I'm already exhausted. There's still a long way to go. I'm still at least 100 yards from the Union lines. They would have been pouring fire down this hill. Men would have been climbing, trying to attack. I, I don't know how they could have done it. I just don't understand this attack at all. We press ahead. Obviously it's January, so things would have looked very different in the summer heat of July. And I'm, I can see I'm not the only one who's made this trek. Some of the, the brush has been knocked down. The last time I was here, they actually had burned all of this area. It was all black and it was all cleared of any brush whatsoever. We're getting a little closer to the monuments now, to the, the position where the Union infantry would have been defending. Oh man, so I got caught on some, some thorns there and it pretty much ripped the phone right out of my hand. But we're very near now to the, the Union lines. You can see how long it took and we'll get a good view of, of what they were looking down on from their position in just a minute. But I'm trying to give you a sense. I know this may not be the most exciting thing to watch, but we're trying to give you a sense of what Robertson's men faced in trying to make this attack. Thorns everywhere. Pretty painful. Here we are, Michigan sharpshooters. Well, I'm very much out of breath, but I finally made it to the position of the Union lines. And you can see behind me the view they would have had looking down on the men. I'm still uh, a good 50 to 75 yards from the top of the hill. I'm in a position that was held by a company of U.S. sharpshooters who suffered four casualties during the battle, but they would have had easy time firing down on the Confederate troops from here. I've uh, almost broken my ankle three or four times. One thing that I don't know if I've adequately conveyed is that in addition to marching up a hill, these rocks are everywhere. Some of them are big, like these ones here, but most of them are small and you can't even see them beneath the brush. And so I'm constantly tripping. There's really no smooth ground. So you're not just marching up a hill in the face of enemy fire. You're constantly tripping. You're getting caught in thorns. Uh, I just, I really don't understand why this attack happened at all. 
we're finally getting to a little clearing here and we're coming up on another monument you can see the incredible view from here as we're near to the top of the line looking down that way that would have been the Union line you can see the top of the Pennsylvania Monument near the center of the Union line and then off this way in the distance you can see the cars on the Emmitsburg Road easily more than a mile away and that you can see all the way to the tree line way off in the distance where the farm is that is where the attack began and this is how much ground they covered to get to this point well it's late afternoon on a sunny january in gettysburg and i believe i am the only person on little round top right now if you come here in the summer there are people everywhere hundreds of people in this layer this area of the battlefield but it's an incredible experience to be here when it's so peaceful and quiet i've been here dozens of times but i've never experienced anything like this Over in that direction, straight ahead, would have been the position occupied by the 20th Maine. And we'll be taking a look at that soon. There are a few places on the battlefield more well known, more visited than this spot here, the spot held by the 20th Maine Infantry under Colonel Joshua Lawrence Chamberlain, his first battle in command of the regiment. He was not a career military officer. He was a college professor who felt it his duty to serve. He took a leave of absence from his actually sabbatical uh, that was supposed to be to uh, study and I believe go overseas, but instead he enlisted, was offered command of a regiment, Was he told uh, those in, in charge that he was not ready for that and so he instead was assigned as the second in command of the 20th Maine under Colonel Adelbert Ames. Ames was placed in charge of a brigade in the 11th Corps prior to the Battle of Gettysburg and so Chamberlain led his brigade or led his regiment here and he was placed in line. He was part of the uh, brigade under Erie, Pennsylvania's Colonel Strong Vincent. I visited his grave. You can click on a link uh, to take you to that if you'd like to see that video from the Erie Cemetery. But Vincent told uh, Chamberlain famously, you are the end of the line. You are the extreme left of the Union line. Under no circumstances can you retreat, can you fall back. You have to hold to the last man. Chamberlain took that literally and earned a Medal of Honor for his actions on this day. From this spot, you can see the entire line of the 20th main infantry you can actually see exactly how they were arrayed right here in front of us is the uh, stone marker which marks the right flank of their position and then it ran behind that stone wall right along here and right to the monument to the 20th main that you see at the end of this walkway and that would have been where their colors were placed that you could consider to be the center of their line and then it bent back around the rear side of Little Round Top. And there in the distance now, you can see the marker for their left flank. And we'll get up and take a closer look at this position. Well, no sooner had Chamberlain gotten his men into position here on Little Round Top, then Colonel William Oates's 15th Alabama came charging up this hill uh, from the direction behind me where the roads are and slammed into the 20th Maine. They were driven back. They came again. They were driven back. They kept trying to move further and further around the left of the 20th Maine. Chamberlain sends his uh, one of his companies, I believe Company B, out over into the gap between here and Big Round Top to kind of cover that area. And he doesn't hear from them for a while. He assumes they've been annihilated, annihilated by the men of the 15th Alabama. And so then he has to 
uh, rebuild his line and that's when he extends his colors over here and he extends the line back that way so now they're in an apex where they can be attacked on two sides and he holds against repeated attacks until it becomes clear that they're running low on ammunition and these just incredibly brave Confederates continue to attack up the hill. And so Chamberlain has two options. He can withstand the attack and probably lose every man since they're running out of ammunition, or he can do the only thing that he can do, which is to order his men to fix bayonets and charge. And what he does, many of us are familiar with it, he has this side of the line swing around like a door until they're in a straight line and then just kind of brings them around and they sweep the Confederates down the hill, take them completely by surprise and just take a ton of prisoners. It was just an incredible sight. Uh, it earned the admiration of the men further up on uh, cemetery or on uh, Little Round Top, but don't let it take away from the fact that there was so much more bravery that took place on this hill that day than just the 20th Main. I think the 20th Main it gets so much of the press and gets so much of the glory, but and you can see I got wounded in my attack up cemetery or up. Uh, I keep calling it cemetery up Little Round Top today. I, I took a cut from a uh, from a thorn, but uh, there was a lot of bravery this day that took place. I don't have time to get to it all today because we're losing daylight. But uh, study up a uh, ton of bravery on both sides. Just incredible gallantry, and it's worth reading about. Compared to the attack that Robertson's brigades would have had, our brigade would have had up the steep face of Little Round Top, uh, the attack that Law's Alabamians made, uh, the 15th Alabama, on the position of the 20th Maine, which is just behind me here, was actually much less severe. It's a relatively flat area here. It's by far the flattest uh, assault that one could make on Little Round Top. And so they had an area here where, as they would have come up over the hill, they had a chance to kind of catch their breath and and, and didn't have a real strong uh, steep hill to climb. But it still was a difficult attack on a entrenched fortified position with a stone wall and looking down on the enemy. After Hood had begun his attack and Longstreet saw that they were kind of at the apex and they had really been fully engaged and weren't going to really push much further forward on their own, that's when he sent General McClaw's division on his left into the attack and they smashed directly into the 3rd Corps and basically destroyed it as an effective fighting unit uh, for the rest of the Battle of Gettysburg. Uh, as the 3rd Corps began to fall back, General Barksdale's men uh, flowed through the peach orchard and began to come toward uh, here behind me where Dan Sickles had his headquarters uh, near the Trossel Barn and the Trossel House, which is uh, directly behind me here. Dan Sickles was the only one of the seven Corps commanders in the Army of the Potomac without a West Point education. He was different, and everybody knew that. And as he realized that his headquarters was about to be overrun, Sickles and his headquarters uh, men began to fall back from this position. And it's that point when famously Dan Sickles' right leg was smashed by a cannonball. Uh, he was removed from his horse. It appeared very quickly uh, evident that he was gonna lose the leg. And it's then that Dan Sickles instructed General Burney to take command of the Third Corps and then lit a cigar as he was taken to the rear back toward the Tawny Town Road where he later had his leg amputated. It was that act of heroism under fire, that cool, calm, collected side of Dan Sickles that earned him a Medal of Honor 34 years later. Sickles went on to uh, actually become U.S. Minister to Spain under President Grant. He later went back to Congress and was instrumental in getting the legislation passed that created the Gettysburg National Military Park. So for all of his flaws, for all of his faults, for all of his post-war um, damage that he tried to do to the reputation of General Meade, uh, one thing is for sure, General Sickles is remembered as one of the instrumental people in establishing this park as it is today. And he came back and visited often. There's actually some early video of the early 1900s of General Sickles on his one leg coming to this battlefield. Speaking of the leg, Sickles had it donated to the Army Medical Museum, 
where he would continue to visit it on the anniversary of his amputation every year. It can actually still be seen there today, and I'll throw up a picture of it for you. There's a cool scene in the movie Lincoln by Steven Spielberg a couple years ago of the hairy, still flesh-covered leg of Dan Sickles on display. There is no bloodier spot on the Gettysburg battlefield than where I'm standing now. In fact, this is probably one of the bloodiest spots in American history. I'm standing in the wheat field. On July 2nd, 1863, it would have looked very different. The wheat was about chest high. It was ready to be harvested and it all stood until troops started marching into this area. Uh, it began with Union troops under Colonel Regis de Trobriand who was uh, a brigade commander in Sickles uh, 3rd Corps, as well as elements of another brigade. They initially defended this area until they were eventually attacked. They were then supported by troops arriving from the 5th Corps, from this area behind me here. Uh, just off behind these woods is Little Round Top, and between here and Little Round Top is Devil's Den. The Confederate attack was heading in that direction, as well as up toward the peach, uh, the peach orchard. Eventually, Confederate troops started to slowly make their way from the south up toward this direction and hit de Trobriand's troops. And uh, elements of James Barnes's division then come to the defense of this area from the Fifth Corps to reinforce this area. They pour into the wheat field and begin to attack. And there's a back and forth that takes place over time. And then as more elements of Confederate troops arrive from the south and from the west, uh, General Hancock sends his uh, division under General Caldwell from the north, from that direction to pour into this area as well. It was here in the wheat field that General Zook was killed, as well as one of the Confederate generals. This area ended up changing hands six times before the fighting was over. 6,100 casualties in just over 20 acres of land here in the wheat field, making it by far the bloodiest spot on the battlefield. It was said that night that one could walk from one end of the wheat field to the other without touching the ground, simply by stepping over all the bodies. Also that night, some wild boars uh, had gotten loose in this area and began to actually gnaw at some of the wounded and dying and the dead. And it was said that some men uh, and I apologize in advance, this is a little gross and a little disconcerting, but uh, it was said that some men were disemboweled alive by these boars as they roamed through this no man's land between the Union and Confederate lines. This is the wheat field. I'm not standing at a spot of any real military uh, or historic significance, but it's one of my favorite spots on the battlefield, and I'll show you why in just a minute, because I'm standing on the eastern edge of the wheat field, but I'm in an area 
uh, on what is known as Ayers Avenue today, right near the monument to the 40th Pennsylvania uh, Reserves. Because it's a really fascinating spot to be able to get a picture of the lay of the land. I can see the full wheat field from here. I can see uh, all of Little Round Top from here, just behind me. And I'll give you that look in just a minute. It's a, it's a great place to get a picture of what the topography of this area looks like. And to just stand here and see so much of the battlefield and imagine what must have been going on here in the late afternoon and evening of July 2nd. So we have a little round top there and you see the hill here and the little, the area in between the hill closest to us and little round top on the left is the area that's known as the Valley of Death. It's through there that Plum Run uh, actually runs. And uh, General Crawford actually purchased that land after the war uh, with the idea of building a museum on the slopes of Little Round Top dedicated to his Pennsylvania reserves. And then as you shift this way, uh, just beyond these woods would be Devil's Den. And as we go a little further now, you see the wheat field. And this entire area coming into view is the wheat field. This is the direction from which the Union would have been uh, pouring their reinforcements. But actually from these woods on the left is where the first Confederate troops would have emerged into the wheat field. And this area, you can just imagine what it must have been like that night. One of the more famous scenes from July 2nd is the general absolution given to an entire brigade by Father William Corby, who was the chaplain of the 88th New York Infantry. You can see his statue behind me here on Cemetery Ridge. The Irish Brigade was one of the brigades in the Second Corps Division that was rushed into the wheat field to help stem the tide of the Confederate assault after the Third Corps had broken. Corby gave absolution to the Catholic soldiers of that brigade who by this point only numbered something like five to 600 men and was, was really the size of some of uh, the larger regiments in the Union Army. But the men uh, prayed and they dashed ahead into the wheat field and into destiny. Father Corby, by the way, went on after the war to twice become the president of the University of Notre Dame. This is also a really good location to be able to see what General Sickles would have seen, as this would have been the northern end of his position on Cemetery Ridge that day. And you can see the higher ground ahead. And uh, that's the Trossel Barn where Sickles was later wounded. And beyond the barn, way off in the distance, you can see the Longstreet Tower where the Confederates had their position on Seminary Ridge. To the south from here, you can see the slopes that lead up to Little Round Top and then Big Round Top beyond. The final phase of Longstreet's assault that day on the Union left flank was to be an attack by a division of the Third Corps under A.P. Hill that was meant to be to the left of uh, General McClaw's division that was supposed to attack more to the center of Cemetery Ridge. That attack unfolded right around the time that General Hancock, who commanded the Second Corps, had sent Caldwell's division rushing into the wheat field to stop the Confederate attack under McClaws that had pushed through and broken the Third Corps. And so this area was lightly defended when a Confederate brigade under Wilcox came charging toward this position on Cemetery Hill. Hancock came down to this area and found 262 men in the 1st Minnesota. It was the only regiment of Minnesota troops that was in the Army of the Potomac. It was also the first regiment of Minnesota troops that was raised during the war. The 262 men were under command of a man named William Colville. And when, when Hancock arrived and saw those men, he said, my God, is this all the men we have to defend this area? And then he famously orders Colville 
forward to charge with his 262 men. And he says, take those colors, pointing to the colors uh, of the brigade under Wilcox. The Minnesota men bravely charge down the slopes behind me, smash right into Wilcox's men and buy time with their lives for, uh, for Hancock to bring up other reinforcements to uh, solidify this position. The Minnesota men lost 82% casualties at the Battle of Gettysburg. It was the highest number of casualties by any unit in the Union Army during the war. Only 47 men were left able to fight. And yet, miraculously, surprisingly, incredibly, the Minnesota men were also here on this position on July 3rd. And they have another monument up by, by the Copes of Trees because they helped to repel Pickett's Charge on day three. It's not only one of the most incredible events of the Battle of Gettysburg, it's one of the most incredible events in the history of American warfare, and it's one that doesn't get nearly enough credit. One last thought about the first Minnesota. General Hancock was effusive in his praise for the gallantry of these men and what was at stake that day. Much later, President Calvin Coolidge, in commenting on the action of the first Minnesota at Gettysburg that day, said that they were rightly uh, entitled to the title of saviors of the country for their actions that day. The first Minnesota deserves to be remembered. Well, there's so much more to the battlefield of Gettysburg than I'm able to show in a short video such as this. There's so much more to the second day's fighting and even just the assault by Longstreet on the Confederate uh, right, the Union left on the afternoon and evening of July 2nd. Entire books have been written just about that day's fighting. I would encourage you to do more research and to study those things for yourself. I would love to hear your thoughts. Let's have a conversation. Let's have a discussion about the things that I've covered here today. Use the comment section below and let's talk more about what happened on July 2nd, 1863, one of the most consequential days in all of American history. Thanks for watching, guys.